thank you uh, dr murphy uh, good evening everyone it's my indeed great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker dr daniel murphy uh, in a very brief uh, is working as a research scientist at noma and his research area includes single particle mass spectrometry and uh, uh, the aerosol instrumentation and he has been uh, he has several lead author research publication in various uh, peer uh, peer reviewed scientific journal and he has been also recipient of several prestigious award including uh, 2012 uh, he was elected as a american geophysical union fellow so with this brief uh, i request dr daniel murphy to start the webinar thank you okay yes and thank thank you for this opportunity to talk to you um i'm going to be talking a lot about aerosol sinks in this uh presentation i'll say a little bit about why i do that and i've listed some of my coworkers there's a whole group um Carl Freud, Greg Schill and Chuck Brock actually did a lot of the work in here. I'm going to talk about sea salt, which is not it doesn't get a lot of attention as an aerosol and it turns out to be a really excellent tracer of aerosol sinks. A little bit about smoke and dust and then I'll talk about some optical properties in the sun photometer that I know there's interest from from your institution. And as I give this talk, I don't know what you're 
particles, and then there's a mode of small particles in the northern hemisphere that isn't there in the southern hemisphere. So what we can do is we can put the palms data on top of this. So go to the next slide. And what we do here is um, we apportion the size distribution by the palms data. So we say that of the particles between one and two microns that we measured in palms, uh, they were almost all sea salt. So we're gonna take that aerosol size distribution and color it blue for sea salt above one or two microns. And in the smaller particles, you can see that sort of blue hatched is uh, sulfate organic particles, mixed particles, which are um, either biological or pollution, some mixture of those. And uh, they're mostly small particles. And there's a lot more of them in the Northern Hemisphere because there's a lot more land for biological processes and a lot more pollution in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so this all makes sense. And the reason we combine the two instruments is it's much, much more accurate uh, than using just the PALMS instrument. Um, and this is very simple in principle, saying we're going to take the big particles in PALMS and apply their composition to the big particles in the Aerosol instruments, it's one of these things where it's simple in concept. There's lots and lots of details that I give a lot of credit to Carl Freud, who is in my group, for working out a lot of the details. When you've done this, you, you can get the volume of just the sea salt particles by integrating the area under the curve. So if you take the area under the blue area under the curve, that's the volume of the sea salt particles. So at this point, we have a quantitative measure of sea salt. Uh, go ahead. And for uh, to know that we're doing it well, uh, there were also on the airplane filter samples. And this is the comparison between the filter samples of sodium and our uh, sea salt mass. And you expect the data to be a little off one to one because seawater is not pure sodium. And you also expect the data to be a little off one to one because the instruments have different responses to large particles. Um, their data is far more quantitative, and I was very happy that we matched up this well. But why should we use their our data instead of theirs if theirs is more accurate? Um, ours is much more sensitive, a couple orders of magnitude more sensitive. And the other reason is um, we have better time response, and it's actually important. There's actually problem sampling when the plane is flying through clouds and their samples take like half an hour. So if the plane flies through a cloud for 30 seconds, uh, you might have to throw out half an hour's worth of data, whereas our instrument, we throw out 30 seconds worth of data if we're in cloud for 30 seconds. Um, so uh, we're very happy with the quantitation. We think we're getting reasonable numbers. Go ahead. So that's kind of an introduction to how we measure sea salt. So now I'm going to talk about what we can learn about aerosol loss processes from the sea salt. So what are the aerosol loss processes in the atmosphere? Um, one is there's actually a very closely coupled pair of evaporation after dilution and chemical loss. And these are most important very close to sources. So for instance, if you have a car and you measure right behind the exhaust pipe, you actually measure a lot more aerosol than you do, say, a kilometer away from the same car. Um, and it's because uh, as you dilute it, some of the aerosols evaporate and there's chemical loss. Uh, there's also gravity, particles can fall. Uh, in the lower atmosphere, that's mostly important for particles bigger than about five microns. Go ahead. And then there's the deposition processes. Uh, it's typically, um, divided into dry deposition and wet deposition. So dry deposition, think if you're in a house where a smoker had lived or lives, the walls are a little dirty, and that's because some of the smoke particles in a dry fashion attach themselves to the walls. Uh, this also happens here in the atmosphere. Of course, it's only important next to the ground. Uh, where the aerosols can attach. And it also turns out aerosols have fairly low deposition rates compared to gases like ozone or uh, nitrate or something like that. Wet deposition is the most important loss process for aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, 
there's two kinds, in cloud and below cloud, which I've indicated schematically. You can start with a little black dot. That's an aerosol particle. Uh, in a cloud, water forms on the particle. And then if it gets big enough, it turns into a raindrop and stops, starts falling. And that removes it from that part of the atmosphere. So that's in cloud removal. And then below cloud removal is that as that raindrop falls, it might hit an aerosol particle on the way down and remove it. Um, and so I'm not going to get a lot into the details on the in cloud and below cloud, just pointing out that they're there. Also point out that these, I drew a water droplet, but this same thing happens with snow and ice. And the details of course are different for snow and ice than they are for water. And I would point out uh, to you that even in the tropics, snow and ice processes are important because snow and ice is not just in the polar regions, uh, even if snow and ice are above you, you know, at uh, 10 kilometers altitude, there's snow and ice in the clouds, uh, not not lick liquid water. Uh, go ahead. So I'm going to get back and look at our sea salt data, and this is a global distribution of sea salt. Um, horizontal axis is latitude, and then we have altitude. And this amazing mission with the DC-8 where we actually covered this much of the atmosphere. And then the points are the amount of sea salt color coded. Um, naturally, the high sea salt concentrations are close to the ocean surface. And as you get up in the atmosphere, uh, you have less and less sea salt. And the vertical gradient, this is a lo multi-order log scale. The vertical gradient is very strong. Um, there is more than a thousand times less sea salt in the upper atmosphere than there is near the ocean surface. And the purple is actually less than five parts per trillion of ocean sea salt. And we can actually measure with our instrumentation down into that range, which is really a new, new result. So go ahead. Um, so now I'm going to start getting into some of what we learned about loss processes. So before I showed you a volume distribution of all the particles, this is a number distribution. So even though most of the mass of the sea salt is above a micron, most of the number is below. And re remember that, you know, mass goes as the diameter cubed. So a two micron particle has a thousand times the mass of a 0.2 micron particle. Uh, so it, it can dominate the volume even in the mass, even though there aren't very many of them. What I'm comparing here is the size distribution of the sea salt particles we measured below 1.1 kilometers flying over the ocean. So you're flying, you know, very close to the ocean surface. And the sea salt particles that we measured between four and 10 kilometers in altitude, except there's a lot fewer of them. So I multiplied the dash curve by a thousand. And the really amazing thing is how well these match. Um, there's really no obvious size distribution. So you've taken out 99.9% of the sea salt particles and it's pretty even. You took out 99.9% .9 of the small ones and you took out 99.9% .9 of the big ones, uh, which is a pretty nice result for thinking about size for removal of the particles. Go ahead. So, the other thing I'm going to do here is um, plot sea salt as a function of water vapor, and that's on the left curve, showing sea salt on the vertical, water on the horizontal, and um, in dry air, there's much less sea salt. And the reason I'm plotting it with respect to water vapor, why, why would I choose that rather than altitude or ozone or any other thing I could try, is that uh, Wet deposition is important, and of course, precipitation removes both water and sea salt. So um, we get good consistent correlations between water and sea salt. Go ahead. Um, so here's some correlations, and what I've done here is I've now, uh, is I'm showing that um, we did this in four different seasons. So I'm showing the relationship of water and sea salt in the summer and the winter. And in the winter, I didn't want to put too many curves on, but in the winter, I 
have a northern hemisphere winter and a southern hemisphere winter, which are six months apart. And so that during winter, we see um, more sea salt for the same amount of water vapor. Uh, and um, it's, it's because it's winter. It's not because we were in the winter hemisphere of the world, if, if you can follow that. And there's a lot more sea salt in the upper atmosphere, in the dry upper atmosphere in winter. And the reason is very simple. In winter, the air starts out drier, it, so it doesn't rain as much in winter. And so you don't have as much wet removal. Go ahead. And there's actually, a, I have, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the corollary, it's going a little slow. So you, you can actually be a little more quantitative on this and you can look at the slopes on, this is a log log plot, you look at the slopes on a log log plot. And if you think about what a slope on a log log plot means, if every time you removed half the water, you removed half the sea salt, that would give you a slope of one on a log log plot. Um, and through large portions like the red dash curves uh, at the, on the left side are slopes of one. So through large portions of the atmosphere, it's actually a really simple removal process. When you remove half the water, you remove half the salt. When you remove 90% of the water, you remove 90% of the salt. Except it looks like in the summer where there's a lot of rain, you actually remove sea salt faster than you do the water in a relative sense. And something that was surprising to me here is that um, the slope of removing half the salt every time you remove half the water continues into regions of the atmosphere where there are only ice clouds. And it's not so obvious to me that it has to be that way. Go ahead. Um, so now we're going to compare to a model. In aerosol removal in models is parameterized. And, um, not quite knowing the audience. Um, the uh, parameterization in the model means the model can't actually calculate it. What they do is um, they look at the conditions in the atmosphere and say, oh, this is, there's some other equation that we'll use for how much we remove. This is a comparison to the GS5 model that was run by Hui Shang Bian. And it the observations are in dashed and the model is in solid and they do a very good job of reproducing the summer winter difference, amazingly good job and getting the absolute amounts where the model doesn't do quite so well is in really, really dry air. It's not removing quite enough of the uh, sea salt out of the model. Go ahead. This is a comparison to a different model, the community or system model run by Peng Fei you and the upper solid curves there are the initial model which was off by factors of more than a hundred and punk fei found a uh, basically a mistake in the model where it was not properly removing aerosol that was entrained in updrafts this is a very specific situation you have a parameterized convective storm and then there is a pr another parameterization that says there's entrainment into the air that's going up into the updraft and it wasn't removing the aerosol properly. And he fixed that and there's a now a revised model that was really an excellent match to the observations. Go ahead. Um, there are some gas phase implications of not having much sea salt in the upper atmosphere or of removing all of this. Um, I'll just do this quickly. Uh, one of the things, gas phase Im implications, is that um, sea salt actually gives off halogens because nitrate and sulfate are stronger acids, so they can displace the um, chlorine and the bromine. And if you had a lot of sea salt getting into the upper atmosphere, it would actually be important for the bromine budget of the upper atmosphere. And it turns out that our observations show that there's not enough sea salt getting into the upper atmosphere to change the bromine budget. Go ahead. So the conclusions about sea salt, um, we can measure the amount of sea salt and the models do pretty well after identifying the a problem in the CESM module. And uh, there's a new global data set to test wet scavenging for models. Uh, go ahead. 
So I'll talk now a little bit about smoke in the remote atmosphere. Uh, we can measure smoke in much the same way that um, uh, we do sea salt. You start with the size distribution, look at the particles that are identified by the mass spectra as smoke. And by smoke here, I mean biomass burning smoke, not um, and also maybe cooking smoke coming up from the surface, not uh, you know cigarette smoke or so. That's not significant. Uh, interesting thing about smoke is that it's a significant fraction of particles even in clean regions of the atmosphere. So this is a bunch of altitude latitude parts showing the fraction of smoke. And anything with green or yellow, the smoke is a third or more of the particles. And very large regions of the atmosphere have more than a third of the particles being smoke. And even in the southern hemisphere, we went out four times and you can see the April May one was clean in the southern hemisphere not much smoke but uh, going back um, September October there was a lot of smoke through much of the atmosphere and again these measurements are over the middle of the ocean we're not measuring downwind of any obvious fires and it turns out that the fraction of particles through sort of the middle portion of the atmosphere that's smoke is about a third um, and about half of the smoke here is too dilute uh, to be seen from space. So there's a lot of smoke in the atmosphere that's really thin, important for the background atmosphere, that's not part of an obvious smoke plume that you would otherwise easily identify. Go ahead. So we, we can also compare to the models uh, like we did for sea salt. This is a more conventional model comparison showing uh, profiles vertical profiles at different um, uh, local locations around the world. Go, go ahead, because um, it's going to be a... Uh... So at each one of these, uh, the black is the observations, with the gray being sort of an uncertainty in the observations. Uh, the blue is the initial model, and the red is a model with increased wet removal in the model. And I, I circled the northern hemisphere tropics over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, down near about two kilometers altitude, there's a lot of smoke, and that's smoke that's blowing out over the Atlantic from Africa. It's the smokiest air we measured all the way around the world. Um, and the model is doing an excellent job of getting that right. It's got the source of fires over Africa, pretty, pretty does a pretty good job. But when you get into the upper atmosphere, the initial model had far too much smoke in the upper atmosphere. So what's telling that's telling you is that the model source was correct, but the sink was incorrect. And that there is a revised model with increased wet removal, which is the red, which matches the observations much better, uh, not only in that part of the world, but if you look at the other regions over other parts of the world as well. So we learned something in this model about removal by comparing the smoke. Go ahead. Um, we also have dust measurements uh, around the atmosphere. Carl Freud has a paper on this, just came out about a week ago, actually. Um, and the um, on this plot, a little complicated, the sort of color-coded stripes are our observations, and the background shading is the model, and it does pretty well. Um, for instance, if you look on the Atlantic side near the tropics, it's showing both the observations and the model show the dust coming off the Sahara. Um, again, I don't want to have to take the time to go into details. Just like for the smoke, uh, the wet removal in the model had to be increased to match the observed dust. So we've sort of identified a consistent pattern where there needs to be more wet removal to match smoke, dust, and sometimes sea salt in the remote atmosphere. Go ahead. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about optical properties. Optical properties of particles are really important for a couple of reasons. One is visibility, depends on the optics, and also the climate impact of particles, depends on how much light they scatter back to outer space, which is an optical property. So 
the way we work on optical properties is again to start with the size distributions and i want to say here it's an important measurement that doesn't always get enough credit um, we can then from those size distributions you can calculate the optical properties you can say we have this many particles that are 500 nanometers in diameter we do the me scattering calculations that tells us the optical properties but to really do it, you need chemical information, and this can come from the single particle mass spec or from the aerosol mass spectrometer on the airplane. Go ahead. Um, and so Chuck Brock put in a lot of time uh, doing this, and here is, again, an altitude-latitude profile of observations uh, from this tomography mission showing the local extinction, which is the loss of light due to either scattering or absorption, um, as a function of altitude and latitude in the Pacific and Atlantic. Um, and calibration and verification are absolutely crucial. So Chuck did things like he compared the two optical particle counters in the size range where they overlap. Um, and that's on the left and a very excellent one-to-one -one comparison. We also on some of the flights had a cavity ring down extinction measurement and he can calculate the extinction from the optical particle counters from the size distributions and compare it to the measured extinction. And um, again, an excellent one-to-one -one agreement. Uh, so we're quite confident in these calculated extinction values. Go ahead. So um, what do you see in some of the extinction values? You see lots of extinction below about one kilometer. The atmosphere is ha haziest near the surface. And again, this is a log scale in the color. So by a large margin, the haziest atmosphere is near the surface. Uh, the upper atmosphere in the tropics is the, is the, tends to be the cleanest. Uh, above eight kilometers in tropical regions. Go ahead. And another thing you see is that the Northern Hemisphere is dirtier than the Southern Hemisphere. Again, that's not terribly surprising, but we have good measurements now. And you see the highest extinction values were over the Atlantic in the trop tropics to slightly north of the tropics, and that's outflow from Africa, both uh, from uh, dust and uh, biomass burning. Go ahead. But the really nice thing is when you don't just have the size distributions, but you have chemical data from instruments like the particle mass spectrometer, you can look at the reasons for the extinction. So you can calculate not only the total extinction, but you, you can also calculate uh, the, calc the extinction from each kind of particle. So the middle panel there, panels are the extinction from dust. And you, you can see that over the Atlantic, uh, just north of the tropics, there's a lot of extinction from dust. Uh, go ahead. Oh no, I'm oh I'm saying this slightly cut off on my screen. So so go back. You all you 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 can also see I show in the bottom panel the extinction due to sea salt, and um, it's um, you know again not surprisingly down near the surface, uh, most of the extinction is due to sea salt. Go ahead. And so this uh, shows some more averages in vertical profiles of extinction from all different kinds of particles. And there are common features around the world. One of that is that uh, much of the extinction is at low altitudes and much of the extinction is due to water in the particles because um, particles at various relative humidities absorb different amounts of water. Go ahead. And the water content is very, very hard to measure. Um, and the reason is that, you know, the what you're really interested in is the particles that are out in the atmosphere. But we measure the particles inside an aircraft cabin. And, you know, it's impossible to keep the aircraft cabin at exactly the same temperature as the outside air outside the aircraft, especially at high altitude. It's a lot warmer in the aircraft cabin, of course. And when you change the temperature, you change the relative humidity, and that changes the amount of water in the particles. So although we can measure, for instance, the sulfate content of the particles, 
we have to calculate the amount of water in that they had when they were out in the atmosphere. Go ahead. And that is really kind of the link into the importance of things like the mini miniature sun photometer um, that I'm not working on very much anymore. Part, a lot of it's because this uh, mass spectrometer and tomography data has been so exciting. It's just been pulling me up full time. And part of it is flight opportunities on uh, UAVs aren't great, but that's a different story. Uh, so we have this miniature sun, sun photometer that I know some people uh, at your institution are uh, working on um, getting up and running. Go ahead. And so what's important about this is that the sun photometer measures the particles as they are in the atmosphere. So these are data from the uh, paper we published on that from a flight in Svalbard on a very clean day showing that we could see the hazy air down near the surface because the um, you start losing more light in the hazy air compared to the dash curves, which are Rayleigh scattering for uh, air, air with no particles in it. Go ahead. Um, so that doing profiles with that sun photometer is actually very important for learning about the atmosphere sort of as it is in place rather than after you've sampled it. We're continuing work on our mass spectrometer um, in cooperation with Dan Sitso. We've just built uh, two new versions of it with um, much better time of flight mass spectrometers. We're getting much better performance and flying them on very high altitude aircraft, the ER-2 and the B-57. Uh, go ahead. And sort of the summary here, um, combining size distribution with chemical composition uh, allows us to study aerosol sinks and to calculate climate relevant optical properties. And I'm sort of proud of being able to study the sinks. It's a contribution that's different than uh, studies of sources. And I think, you know, like going through these thoughts and also, you know, looking at preparing this talk, there are some lessons learned. And one of them is the vital importance of carefully calibrated size distributions. And if you're out making measurements, one of the most important things you, you can do is do carefully calibrated size distributions. And it's not, doesn't get the attention as the mass spectrometers that like I run, but they're really important. And the other thing is that we really need, especially if we're interested in climate, to compare measurements at ambient conditions uh, such as with the sun photometer to the more detailed measurements that you, you can make after you either bring air into a, um, in our case, an airplane, but it also applies if you're on the ground and you have a, you know, a uh, trailer somewhere filled with aerosol instruments and you're making measurements, uh, the relative humidity inside that trailer is different than it was outside. And uh, so we always need to think about our measurements that we make and how they compare to what was actually out in the atmosphere in terms of water content. So uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you very much. So it's now uh, open for question answer. So you can ask a question if you have any. No question. Okay, maybe I think they will have some question later on and I'll get back to you. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So, I mean, I, yeah, so, I, so I, 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 I hope this was clear and um, yeah, go, go ahead uh, with I what have, you were saying. 
Yeah, I have one question uh, in one of your slides uh, uh -huh. where you have shown uh, where you have shown smoke. Uh, yeah, this slide. So recently, we also conducted uh, about ten years Calypso uh, measurements over entire mm -hmm. Indian region, and Calypso is basically a, a, a space bone lighter. And what mm -hmm. we also found is very similar to uh, you know the result which you have shown in these slides. The aerosol plumes, uh, you know, between two to six or sometimes two to eight kilometer. But my question is that compared to the the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, the smoke uh, concentration looks like much higher. So could you please shed some light on this in um, particular? Yeah, what, what, what you're what you're seeing here is bec because this is expressed as a fraction of the number of particles. So sometimes in the southern hemisphere, the smoke was a very large fraction of the number of particles, but there are a lot fewer particles than in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> okay. So it's so it's so it's not that there's more smoke. <laughs> It's sometimes that there's less other stuff in the southern hemisphere, and that gives you a high fraction of smoke. Okay, thank you. Yes, is that clear? Uh, any other questions from audience? I think there are a few participants joining through YouTube, about 24, 25 participants. Uh huh. So, yeah, around 26, in fact. Oh, good. So, unfortunately, they cannot ask <laughs> questions. Very easily, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so probably if anyone asks me in or send me a question, I will forward to you, and then I think you can have a look and then respond to those questions, if any. Okay, yes. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd be happy to respond by email. Yeah. So... Students, no questions? It's the right time to interact with Dr. Murphy. Okay, so if there is no question, uh, let us thank uh, Dr. Daniel Murphy for his uh, time, uh, you know, and a wonderful webinar he has delivered today with us. And I spare his very valuable time today. So on behalf of all participants and uh, IST, I really thank you for wonderful webinar. I hope in near future we'll have uh, more interaction. And I at this juncture, I also would like to thank you for your you know kind support and help for my two students working on miniaturized sun photometer. So that help is really very much appreciated. So thank you very much for your effort and sharing those valuable information with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, and you're you're very welcome for that. And I mean, the great thing about these virtual seminars is that we're able to do it over this distance. So yeah. that's a that's actually a real real priv privilege in some ways that uh, we we can communicate across continents so easily. <laughs> Okay. So thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining. Okay. Thank you.